Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. Once again, it is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. And I'm joined by one of my regular guests, Paul Offit. Uh, Paul is a physician in the Maurice R. Hillman Professor of Vaccinology in the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, and certainly one of the uh, world's recognized leaders in vaccinology. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Happy to be here. So, Paul, I, I thought we'd start with good news. Um, it's been a struggle the last the last year. Uh, hospitalizations, 130,000 to 80,000. The number of deaths are finally coming down. We're vaccinating individuals at about 1.5 million injections a day, not individuals. I appreciate that. Um, the estimate is that 40 million uh, uh, shots have been given. It, there's a difference between Bloomberg and the CDC, so I'm splitting the difference, say 40 million. But at 1.5 million a day, in the next 60 days, that means we'll have given 100 million injections in the United States. Essentially, all people older than 65, all essential workers, if they will have wanted the vaccine, will have gotten one dose. I think I'm optimistic that we will really begin to see a substantial decline um, by March and April. What, what are your thoughts? I agree. I mean, it's mid-February. This is, for the most part, a winter virus that, although it does spread, it does it is transmitted to some extent over the summer. It, it thrives in the winter. If it's spread by small droplets in the winter, you know, it's it's not as humid. People are are, are gathered together. Yet we have in mid-February a clear drop in cases, a clear drop in hospitalizations. Why? I think the answer is immunity. Immunity that's been induced by induced by natural infection and immunity that's been induced by vaccination. So right now it's listed that 27 million people have been infected, but that's just 27 million people who've been tested and found right. to be infected. When you did antibody surveillance studies back in November before there was a vaccine, that number of, of number of cases, uh, a number of cases in this country was off by a factor of four. So let's assume it's still off by around a factor of four. If that's true, that 27 million is probably closer to between 80 and 100 million people. So you're already talking about at least 25 percent of the population that has been exposed to this virus. That add to that the 40 million doses that are out there now that that's those are our first doses. So right. it's a two dose vaccine and you want to see uh, people get their two doses. And probably, probably right now it's about two to three percent of people have gotten uh, both doses. But but, you know, but the, that first dose does provide some immunity. So if you if you take that 25 percent added the 40 million, then maybe subtract 20 percent because some people have already been infected or getting vaccinated. But so now you're up to around 35 percent. You know, if you look at polio, which is, is does have a couple similarities. So, so polio, um, obviously, it, it's, it's a disease primarily of children. It was a summer disease. But it's, its contagiousness index was roughly similar to this virus. And it spread primarily by the asympt by asymptomatically. You started to see a decline in polio cases when you started to get to 35 percent to 40 percent immunization rates. So I think you're seeing what you're seeing is the consequence of natural immunity and vaccine induced immunity. And I think it's going to continue to drop. I mean, the two things that stand in the way of that, and we can talk about that, are one, whether variants become a problem, right. and two, whether the anti-vaccine movement, or at least an anti-vaccine sentiment, becomes a problem. Uh, let's return, we'll return to the variants and the, and the issue about uh, vaccine hesitant anti-vaccineers, which are, they're slightly different groups. Um, but I, I want to go backwards, because one of the questions that came up so early on um, was how safe for these vaccines. And that, that obviously uh, is part of the discussion about vaccine hesitancy. Well, internationally, we're well above 100 million people being vaccinated internationally with the two Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. We'll t talk about some of the other vaccines. Has any new safety signal come up from uh, that, that you're aware of? No, so, so the advisory committee for immunization practices about a week ago went through the data they have on on possible safety signals. So in other words, Bell's palsy, which is you know, unilateral facial palsy, which was seen in seven uh, of the of the roughly 37,000 people that had gotten the vaccine pre-licensure as compared to only one in the placebo group. You worry that that might have been a problem, but at least they found that there, there appeared to be no difference in the vaccinated or unvaccinated population for Bell's palsy. I mean, you've heard about 
thrombocytopenic purpura as as following this this vaccine. But when but when you've seen it, it's been like a day later or two days later. That's too fast. I mean, this is presumably an immune mediated phenomenon, an antibody mediated phenomenon. That's just too fast to see that. Then, so there are always going to be these temporal associations, and you read about them in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. But at least for right now, those temporal associations have not been found to be causal associations. You know, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are designed to prevent SARS-CoV-2 infections. Not everything that else that happens in life. So there's always going to be these temporal associations. And the CDC is right on top of this through the vaccine safety data link to make sure that those temporal associations aren't causal. But but it's amazing. I mean, here you have a virus that, that this elusive, difficult to characterize virus that's had a number of clinical surprises and pathological mm. surprises that you are meeting with a, a technology, messenger RNA vaccines, with which we have no commercial experience. I mean, I was wor- I think anybody who was paying attention to this was worried that there might have been something unpleasant that we were going to find out eventually that we wish we knew now. But for right now, no. I mean, Maurice Hilleman, who I consider the father of modern vaccines and that he did the primary research or development on nine of the 14 vaccines we give the kids, said it best. Quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. Well, the first three million doses are out there, the first 40 million doses are out there in the U.S., and hundreds of millions of doses are out there in the world. I can't emphasize how encouraging that is because so many people have said they, they want more data or they want to wait longer. Um, there's At this point, the, the, the data are just going to be multipliers of what we already know. Um, you know, great, it'd be nice to have a year of data, but we're out six months from people who initially were vaccinated over the summer and there's, there, there is no reported side effects uh, of major concern from the vaccine. And I, I think it's so important to emphasize that. Um, let's go on um, to the other two important issues that you talked about. We've now published a number of viewpoints on variants. We published a research letter just about an hour or two ago about the California variant. No uh, uh, epidemiologic data to describe what the risks from it could be. Um, uh, Tony Fauci, John Muscala have written an accompanying editorial about variants in, in, in general. Uh, I was uh, struck by the term variants of concern. It made me think that it was like a TV show or something, um, uh, but that there's literally thousands of variants and then some emerge as variants of concern. Um, and people are concerned about the variants. Your, your take. Yeah, well, it's reasonable to be concerned about the variants. I mean, this virus um, it continues to drift at some level. And the question is, is it going to drift so far that immunity that's induced by natural infection or immunity that's induced by vaccination is not effective? Now, the t- here's the way I see this. Here's when you should worry. You should worry when people who have been either naturally infected or have completed their immunization series are nonetheless hospitalized with one of these variants. That tells you, I think, that an important line has been crossed. That hasn't happened yet. I mean, it, it's, 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 I think certain things are clear. First of all, the, the, the virus that initially circulated in Wuhan was not the virus that left China. The virus that left China and ultimately spread across the U.S., across Europe and into the U.S. was the first variant, the so-called, you know, D614G variant. That was the first variant. Um, and then since then, there's been the U.K. variant. Right. Uh, you're not supposed to actually use the country. No, no, I, I can't remember the numbers. Maybe you can. E117 variant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's close enough to the to the the original virus that, that what Tony often refers to as the wild type virus that that it looks like immunization or natural infection is going to pro- with with what we have now is going to protect against that variant the more worrisome ones are the south african and brazilian variants which are very close so to to talk about one is to talk about the other Um, That, if you look at at studies, for example, what you care about, by the way, is is not necessarily the studies that are done in vitro, where they take serum from people who are naturally infected or serum from people who have been immunized and see whether it neutralizes that virus in the laboratory, because that's looking at just one aspect of the immune response. And what you really care about, the proof in the pudding here is the clinical response. So, for example, when Johnson & Johnson did their trial in South Africa, they found, for example, that where they had 72 percent protection against moderate to severe disease in the U.S., It was only 57% in South Africa, but they were able to prevent, apparently, hospitalization and death from that virus in South Africa. In South Africa, the strain that's circulating primarily is is, is the South African variant, the B351 variant. 
Um, so that's good news. I mean, that's what you want. You just want this this vaccine to keep you out of the hospital, keep you out of the ICU and keep you from dying. And right now, that all appears to be true. I mean, you're making a polyclonal antibody response against a variety of of, uh, of epitopes on that virus. And right now, that response appears to be good enough to protect you from severe disease. I, I just want to reemphasize something you just said. So um, when a new variant uh, uh, emerges and it's tested against uh, a sera of someone who's been uh, vaccinated, it's only testing a very small aspect of the immunologic response. And, and, and so it is likely that, that in, in uh, real life, in vivo, the vaccine is going to actually be more effective. And as you said, the real test is does it prevent serious disease? It's nice to get preliminary data from the lab, but what you really want is that epidemiologic data. Now, Paul, have you been surprised about the rapidity with which these variants of concern have emerged? I know there's been literally thousands of variants, but we're, we now have the three that you mentioned. We, we don't know about this California variant that we reported in JAMA today. Are, have you been surprised about how quickly they have emerged? No. I mean, it's it's a bat coronavirus. It is adapting itself to growth in the human population. And, and the way in which it will adapt is it wants to be more easily transmitted. I mean, that's, that's the goal of this virus, to live by being transmitted from one person to the next. So the UK variant appears to be more contagious. The South African variant sort of took over in South Africa. The Brazilian variant took over in Brazil and the Amazon. Um, that's what the virus does. That, that, that makes sense to me. You just want to make it so that there aren't a critical number of mutations in the so-called receptor binding domain or the N-terminal domain of that spike protein that causes polyclonal sera induced by natural infection or polyclonal sera induced by immunization that it can no longer effectively keep you from being hospitalized. That's what you're worried about. And right now we just had an NIH so-called active group meeting, which is a group that was put together by Francis Collins to talk about these vaccines. We actually thought we were done, but with the, the variants now arising, we're, we're, re, uh, we're meeting again. But that was the theme of that meeting that, you know, that, that for right now, Although clearly there's there are mutations in, in critical regions, it, it doesn't look like we, this virus has mutated far enough away from the vaccination or natural infection that you, you are going to be at risk of serious disease. That's where we are right now. Hopefully we'll stay there. And I do think that as we move into the summer when the winter get when the weather gets warmer, which makes it even more difficult for this virus to be transmitted, I think as we and more and more people get vaccinated, I feel really good about that, the fact that we're going to continue to go down. What worries me a little bit is when you hit September. Um, and then it gets sort of colder again, and there may be a variant that emerges, and people are now feel better. They're not going to wear masks. They're not going to social distance even more than they're, they're not doing that now. That you could see an emergence of a, of a variant. The variants. The good news is we're much better at sequencing in this country. I think we've increased our sequencing capacity by tenfold, according to Dr. Fauci. And and so I so we're looking, and I and that's the thing we're looking for. Are people going to be hospitalized? with these variants who've already been naturally infected or immunized. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you a bit more about this this timing. So I think you and I are both guardedly optimistic over the next few months, and then we'll get to the summer. And just, you know, theoretically, uh, two-thirds, three-quarters of the U.S. population will have had disease or be vaccinated by the fall. Wearing your hat of enormous concern, um, how does NIAID begin to think about um, a, a more broadly effective vaccine against all variants, a broadly neutralizing vaccine? I, I'm, I'm sure people are really beginning to think past September of 2021, but but when we, we get into late 2021 or 2022 and that, that variant emerges that is generally more problematic with the vaccines, does the science begin now, Paul, to try to think about this kind of broadly neutralizing vaccine? That's already happened. I, I mean, I think that we are certainly paying attention to these variants. And there's one of two ways you can look at this. Um, when you get your first, your second dose of this mRNA vaccine, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, you get a tremendous boost in neutralizing antibodies. And that appears to be good enough to 
to protect you against, for example, the South African variant or the Brazilian variant, which is not how this, these vaccines were constructed. They were constructed against that first variant, the D614G variant. So that's good enough. That's a powerful response that's good enough. So then the question is, if, if this starts to continue, the South African right. variant, do you, do you give just a booster dose of what you've already gotten, which then would be enough for, to cross-react? Or, and I think we're already preparing for this, do you now start to include these variants in, in what would be, I imagine, either a second-generation vaccine where you get this separate vaccine as a, a booster later, or as a multivalent vaccine, where you, which you could do that with an mRNA vaccine, where you actually have sort of both mRNA, uh, the, both, both of those sort of strands of mRNA within that lipid nanoparticle. That could certainly be done. So... We'll see. We're looking. I can tell you, I'm certain that the companies are, are now working with the FDA to figure out what is the path forward in this. Obviously, you're not going to have to do another efficacy trial. It'll be more like the influenza vaccine model where you'll do, you know, some uh, immunogenicity studies prior to uh, allowing for that vaccine to be used. I, I, I feel like um, we've gotten a handle on the science. We can talk about vaccine distribution, but we've gotten a handle on the science. So it sounds like even if a more virulent variant uh, arises, say in the fall of 2021 or the winter of uh, the winter of 2021-22, you think there's enough in this uh, of what we know about the science that we we will be prepared for? It? I think I think so. I mean, if we, if we well, if we have to give, say, a second vaccine, meaning meaning, you know, one that contains the South African variant or Brazilian variant or whatever new variant right. comes up, there will be more variants. I think you can be assured of that. I mean, the hard part is not constructing those those vaccines. The hard part is mass producing them, mass distributing them and mass administering. Them. That's what we're learning. Um, so you, if you had to do that all over again, um, it would be a challenge. But again, we're, we're, we've gotten much better at it. I mean, the thing that was never in place in this country that's getting in place is we never really had a, a mass immunization system for adults. I think that's that's getting in place. I mean, the problem initially was administration, right? You had like only 20 percent of the, the distributed doses were administered. Then it became 30 percent, then 40 percent, right. then 50 percent, then 60 percent. Now it's close to 70 percent. So we have figured out how to distribute it, or at least we're I should say we're better at distributing it. Now the biggest problem is production. Right. No, the, the the report this morning was that the ball field in Los Angeles ran out of vaccine. I thought that was actually good in the sense that that at least it's now be, what, whatever's being produced is being delivered. You know, you, you don't want to see 20 percent of the stock being held on to. Um, Paul, it's likely that in the next few weeks, uh, I'm assuming, given what I've read, you, you may have more information that we may have yet a third vaccine that's approved through emergency use authorization, uh, which will be the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And I'll ask you in a second to compare it to Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, as, as a number of people have said to me, we set the bar so high with Moderna and Pfizer at 95%, uh, people aren't going to feel very good about 60 or 70%, wh whatever it ends up being. Um, and, you know, human nature being what it is, I can imagine people saying, I want two shots to give me 95%. I don't want one shot that gives me 70%. Um, how do you imagine this playing out? No, it's interesting. I mean, if the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and again, uh, we, we meet the FDA's vaccine right. advisory committee meets on February 26th, and so I haven't seen the data. I mean, yeah, okay, just, right. And yep. I know it hasn't been released publicly. It's just press release data. But, but I mean, if you look at that top-of-the-line press release data, it was 72% effective against moderate to severe disease in the U.S. That's good. Um, and it appeared to be virtually 100% effective in preventing, you know, serious disease. That's good. I think if that had been the first vaccine, everybody would have been right. ecstatic. As a single dose refrigerator stable vaccine that's stable for months in the refrigerator, people would have thought this is great. This is easily distributed. It can be sent to rural areas where there's sort of less, you know, less support and everybody would have been really happy. But I, I just think that the messaging here has to be the goal is to prevent moderate to severe disease. And this vaccine can largely do that. And there has, has a number of other advantages. Right now, it's a single dose. Now, there is Johnson Johnson is doing a two dose trial in the United States, which presumably will have data by by April is what I've heard. We'll see. But I mean, worst case scenario, if that second, if the, if the two dose trial shows that it's better, you can just get a second dose down the line. I mean, you don't have to start the series all over again. So there would be that option. But we'll see what the data are. Right now, we don't know those data. With uh, Moderna and Pfizer having increased production and say J&J &J comes available sometime in mid-March um, and, you, you know, we're, we vaccinated 75 million, 80 million people have gotten an initial dose. Um, can you imagine a, a system where 
again, people have choice, and I want to emphasize that, uh, particularly under an EUA, people will have choice, and ASIP will make recommendations that Moderna and Pfizer would uh, go to the highest risk individuals, you know, older than 65, under 65 with other complications, and that uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, would be used for for the remainder of the population. Can you can you imagine that strategy, or is that going to be too complicated? I, I would be surprised. I mean, again, we haven't seen the Johnson and Johnson data, but let's just say theoretically, for the purpose of this discussion, that that one dose of the vaccine pre- prevents people over sixty five years of age a hundred percent of the time from being hospitalized or or go to the ICU or die. If that's true, I would be surprised if the if the uh, CDC then made a differential recommendation on those vaccines. Right right now, we have so much problem mass producing these vaccines, and there are advantages to the J and J vaccine regarding its storage and handling characteristics. So uh, that would surprise me if they did that. But now, on the other hand, if the J and J vaccine, for example, wasn't as effective in in a certain age group or wasn't as effective with people who have certain comorbidities. That's what the CDC does. Then they do make distinctions. But um, for right now, we don't know what those data are, so we'll have to see. Will the vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and then J&J, eventually move to the traditional approval process? Do you have any idea if the companies are planning uh, to move to the tradition, traditional approval process? I'm not sure what they gain from it at this point. I know in the long run there's some gains, but in the short run, I'm not sure if there's many gains. But that question has already come in if they're going to move to traditional approval. It's possible. I mean, that's essentially what happened with Merck's Ebola vaccine when they rolled it out in West Africa. Initially, that was all essentially through an emergency use authorization. And then years later, they came back and and then got a submitted a biologics license application to get a licensure. Um, It's possible. I think the the biggest thing that they need or are going to need to generate are sort of longer term efficacy data. So I think as you get those data, they may go back and and do it as a a BLA. Certainly possible. Is there any reason to think that the um, one particular platform vaccine, the adenovector virus um, versus mRNA, will be more or less effective against a variant or, or uh, the, the platform itself isn't likely to drive one vaccine being more effective against variants than another? Well, they all are, have the same basic yeah. idea in terms of the spike protein. Right, right. So, right. So, 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 th- th- so then the question is, but it's, it's a perfectly reasonable question. You know, does the mRNA uh, vaccine drive a better immune response than the, the replication defective either simian adenovirus vector, which is the, U- the UK AstraZeneca strategy, or the uh, replication defective human AD26, which is the, the Johnson Johnson strategy? I mean, to be determined. We don't have a lot of information for that. We don't have a lot of commercial experience with those vaccines. We'll see. I mean, we're going to learn a lot in, in this process. What, what would be the three or four kind of like if if someone gave you an envelope and said, I have the answer, Paul, to the three questions you really want to know, what would the three questions be, Paul? Well, the, the so under the category of things that worry me the most. Okay, um, that, that's a good category. <laughs> the number, number one is, you know, so number one is, is will there be a variant that is generated that escapes uh, recognition by the vaccine to the point that you aren't protected against severe, severe disease, hospitalization, ICU admission, et cetera? So that, that's number one. Will that happen? Um, do I get to ask that kind of question? Like that, that the kind of question you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay. That would be one. Number two, the, the other things that scare me the most, and it hasn't happened, thank goodness, surprisingly, there doesn't appear to be any serious uh, ad, adverse side effect with these vaccines. I mean, think about that. Uh, vaccines are our way out of this pandemic, our only way out of this pandemic. If there were a serious adverse event, no matter how rare it was, that would cause a lot of people to not get this vaccine. And that would be a disaster. That hasn't happened. So that's good. Um, wait, I get one more question. Yeah. Um, what's the other question I get to have answered? Um, I, I guess what would be what will be the impact of the the sort of anti-vaccine sentiment? I mean, will it be so great as to not allow us to get to herd immunity? I, I guess we're going to find out the answer to that question soon yeah. enough. So, so that moves us into the next portion of the conversation. Uh, you know, we're both pediatricians. And so uh, I think the notion of uh, anti-vaccineers versus people who've been vaccine hesitant, they're different groups of people. Anti-vaccineers remain a very small percent. Prior to COVID-19, a very small percent of the population, one or two percent, that's very different than vaccine hesitant, which 
people, WHO reported worldwide, had reached 20 or 25 percent. So how have you begun to think about that, given your long history and a champion of vaccines, uh, the, the politics of the last year? How have you begun to think about that vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 and vaccine hesitancy? What, what do we need to do? Well, people are less hesitant. I mean, if you look at sort of quite the, the polls that were conducted, say, uh, September, October, and then moving into December and now, now there's e each time they do a poll, a progressively larger percent of, of right. people are saying they're willing to get the vaccine. So I think it's reasonable to be vaccine hesitant. I think, you know, it's it's a it's a frightening virus. A lot of the language that surrounded the development was a little scary. You know, Operation Warp Speed, race for a vaccine, who's going to be the first to cross the finish line? That's a little scary. And it's a novel technology. I, I mean, I think you reasonably could say, wait, let me just see how this plays out initially. Well, it has played out. I mean, once 40 million people have been vaccinated, I think you now have a, a large platform on which to stand that you can say the effectiveness is remarkable. And the safety, as far as we know, appears to be you know, reassuring. And so and I think that's why the numbers are going up for people who are willing to get that. So I think you sh I think we're all vaccine skeptics. I think everybody who sits around the FDA vaccine advisory committee table is a vaccine skeptic. You want to see the data. Well, now you have the data. I think for, for the anti the true anti vaccine activists, the conspiracy theorists, I mean, I use the, the Neil deGrasse Tyson line. I mean, you're never going to talk them out of it. If people reach a conclusion that is not based on science and reason and logic, reason and logic is not going to talk them out of it. So so forget that. But um, and that's my fear, is that they will have impact as they have on social media. Interestingly, RFK Jr. was just sort of um, taken off I saw um, this morning. Instagram, I think, which is, I guess, owned by Facebook. So good. I think there's a recognition that, that you know, mm -hmm. that free speech has limits. And one of those limits is giving people bad information that causes them to make bad decisions that can hurt them or their family. Um, So-called Sputnik. Sputnik, uh, you know, the, the report came out. Um, on one hand, I think uh, people were uh, concerned about the speed and kind of the secrecy around the way the vaccine was approved. It, it's interesting reflecting now in February about what happened at the FDA. Uh, um, the FDA actually did a superb job uh, and has continued to do a superb job around vaccines. I actually think it, it's an important model for novel therapies where we see a press release and a preprint, but no li limited data. I, I think what the FDA has done by saying these are the criteria, we get the data, we produce a 20-page synopsis, it goes to people like you, it enters the public domain, there is a debate, it's public. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what more we could have asked, and actually there's been almost no criticism. Um, but that was not true with Sputnik. A uh, lot of s secrecy around the China vaccines. What, what, what's your sense about the kind of international vaccine effort? And, you know, people have said, you, you know, the U.S. has focused on taking care of people who live in the U.S. And there, there needs to be more of a sense of a kind of global mission around vaccines. The, yeah, to take the, the second issue first, that's certainly true. I mean, how much more information do we need that what happens in one country affects another country here? I mean, we're only as strong in this country as as countries that that are where, where this where it's occurring that this virus is still raging. I mean, we still give a polio vaccine in the United States, even though we haven't had polio in this right. country since the 1970s. We give it because it's still in Pakistan and it's still in Afghanistan. And I mean, only one of 200 people that have polio are actually symptomatic. Do I think it's possible that people shedding polio virus, walk into LAX or walk into LaGuardia Airport? Yes, I think that's perfectly bad. That's why we continue to give that vaccine. So so yes, I think we, we have to be part of this WHO collaborative that, that, that is designed to make sure that every country in this world can, can get the vaccine. I think it was a shame, actually, when the last administration backed away from that. We have an obligation. We have economic and technological advantages that causes us to have an obligation to all those countries. And just looking at it selfishly, you're only as strong as the weakest country out there. So we need to do that. In terms of, of other countries, there is sort of a, a, a somewhat of a depressing nationalism that's kind of surrounded this effort where, um, you know, for example, Vladimir Putin very early on, like back in August, said that, you know, that this that this Sputnik vaccine, which is uh, a two dose vaccine, a replication uh, defective 
ad human adenovirus 26, followed a month later with a replication defective human adenovirus 5. That's their vaccine. He said, we've checked all the boxes when they just finished a phase one trial, <laughs> started a phase three trial yet. So there was that, the, you know, the Chinese had come out initially with the replication defective ad 5, and now it's more of a, a, an inactivated vaccine, which they claim to be, you know, highly effective, but then test went given in Brazil was found to be much less effective. So you, you but again, it's all press releases. You, you just want to see the data. I mean, the, making a, a whole killed and activated vaccine, which the Chinese did, take up the virus, grow it up, take the virus, grow it up, purify it, kill it with uh, the chemical beta propiolactone, which is the way we make the rabies vaccine. I mean, that's a tried and true method. We have a lot of experience with that kind of vaccine. Let's see the data, it, publish it, do, do what you should be doing. And that doesn't happen. And just, you know, you can see that there's a sort of, you know, Russia will send its vaccine and as they have, you know, to their allies. And, and it's just, uh, it's, it's a little messy. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, we we discussed uh, on Monday uh, the issues around women who are pregnant. Uh, a, a number I had a number of guests, and we're we're certain uh, about the recommendations. Not a lot of data yet, but more confident in vaccinating uh, women. Um, but uh, that. But there's uh, 4 million uh, children in each age cohort. So from birth to 20 is 80 million people or birth to 18. Uh, the notion of the trials in adolescents and children. Right. So that that's happening um, there. The initial trials are going to be done down to 12 years of age. They'll involve probably a few thousand children who will get a vaccine to make sure that the dose is right, the dosing interval is right, and that you are consistently inducing a neutralizing antibody response that you um, will predict based on the adult studies will likely protect you. I think you're not going to see efficacy studies in children, these big 30, 40,000 uh, tri trial or participant trials. You're not going to see that. I, and I think I know Jeff Gerber at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is taking the lead on that. And I suspect the next round will be to go down to six years of age. I'm not sure we'll ever get lower than that. But but it's worth it's worth preventing this disease in children. I mean, although it's it, this this uh, virus is not a obviously a common killer of children, the number of children who died this past year was roughly the same as died of influenza. And certainly, children can suffer this multi-system inflammatory disease. Um, so any 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 virus that can cause children to suffer or be hospitalized and even rarely die, if you can prevent it safely, prevent it. So I think we will eventually get there. They just weren't a high priority group because. 92% of the deaths in this country occur in people over 55 years of age. Right. Um, do you anticipate any surprises in children? You know, I, I guess you should always be humble. In these, <laughs> I, I don't. I, I. I. I'd like to think that we're we've learned so much from these mRNA vaccines in in adults, including very young adults. That 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 um, I, I don't anticipate surprises, but you have to be open minded and humble and keep looking because you you know there are invariably surprises in medicine. Right. The, the issue of, about the ACE receptors changing with age, I'm curious. So that interaction with vaccines is it makes me curious about uh, seeing the immunologic response and then the real data, which is what happens in real life. Do they not get uh, do they not get either uh, asymptomatic infection, presymptomatic infection or infected at all? Um, mm -hmm. Just a last uh, question, Paul. It's going to become uh, more difficult Um uh, and that's about mandating vaccine in certain groups or population, college students, teachers, uh, children going to school when a vaccine I is approved. Um, you work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It's part of the HUP system. C can you imagine how mandated vaccination may play out or will not play out in the U.S.? Um, I think I think that it will play out initially in the private sector. I, I think businesses. I, I don't. I don't think states are going to mandate this vaccine. It, it, it's it's a little hard to do that. I mean, these are um, these are approved through emergency use authorization, which is essentially the equivalent of giving permission to use an investigation new new drug. I, I think that. But you could see, for example, airlines uh, say, "Look, I, I, nobody who works on this airline can, can can come onto the airline unless they get a vaccine." So I think the business sector, the private sector, will be the first place you see mandates. If I had to make a guess, this is Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA. And once again, I I've been joined by uh, a friend and a colleague, uh, Paul Offit. Um, 
Paul is the Maurice R. Hilleman Professor of Vaccinology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's just, he's just been a remarkable resource, I think, for guidance and wisdom, uh, both in the United States and around the world during the last year. It's been a difficult year. I, I'm, I'm so pleased, Paul, that both you and I are guardedly optimistic about the springtime. Hopefully the weather will get warmer and you and I will be outside again. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Howard. Take care, Paul. Stay healthy. You too. Bye-bye, Howard. That was fun.